Hi, I'm Randall Heyman. Today's explanation of JPEG is for everyone, even if you hated maths at school. Now I know some of you are going to have doubts about that when you see some of my previous videos like first order linear differential equations made easy, but seriously this video is for anyone who wants to understand how JPEG works. So JPEG stands for Joint Photographic Expert Group and it's a way of storing and transmitting photos. And in fact according to Wikipedia it's the most common way of storing and transmitting photos on the World Wide Web. So here's some photos to get us started. I'm going to ex be explaining JPEG for black and white photos today because it's easier for me to explain but everything I say basically applies for colour. So this photo here, uh, this is going to sound a bit strange for younger viewers, but it was taken on a film camera and then it was developed and printed in a dark room. So I have this physical photo at home. I put it in my scanner, which can measure various attributes of the photo, I suppose. And from the scanner, I then saved it in JPEG format on my computer. So you might want to pause the video for a sec while you think about this, but how would you go about doing that from the scanner? How would you go about saving um, information about the photo so that you can then store and transmit that photo? Well, many people will think this sort of way. You take the photo, over the top of the photo you put a, a grid which divides a photo into a number of squares. And then for every square you get the scanner to measure the brightness or darkness of each square. And you might say that a totally bright or totally white uh, square will, call, will put the number 0, 0 against. And if it's totally dark, which is totally black, we'll say 9, 9. And in between there'll be all the shades of grey. So this one here might be 40 or 50. So we can now record in this uh, array all these numbers which sort of represent the photo. Um, and so we can store and transmit those numbers. Whenever the photo is retrieved, the computer will just look at those um, numbers in the squares, use that to recreate a square that, it, that is uh, bright or dark according to the number that's in the grid and then some sort of approximation from for the photo will then be produced on a computer. So how does JPEG improve this situation? Well here are the numbers I had up before that represent part of the photo and what JPEG does is it represents that part of the photo with only a few numbers. So rather than needing all the numbers I've got there on the left, we'll only need a small number of numbers that I've got on the right there. So because there's less numbers, it means that it's quicker to store information, it takes less memory to store it, and it's also quicker to transmit and receive photos. So that's what JPEG does. Now, next question I suppose is how does JPEG do that? Well, it uses a formula. And I'm going to put the formula up now. I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant about this because there's a saying that you lose 90% of your audience whenever you put up a formula. And this is a bit of a, this is quite a formula. But the good news is I'm only interested in one tiny little part of it. We can ignore all the rest. So don't stop the video yet. Here's the formula. And really all I'm interested in is these three letters, C-O-S. Now when you see this, you might be thinking of cosine from trigonometry at school and surely this is not what's used in JPEG. I mean, after all, what, is, what do we use cosine for in high school? Well, typically it's something like we've got a flagpole, we know the distance to the top of the flagpole is 25 metres, the angle is 30 degrees, how far is it to the base of the flagpole? Even saying all of this is probably sending a shudder through some people so how, surely, surely this is not what is used for JPEG, which after all is nothing to do with angles and distances and things like that. 
Well, it turns out that it is cosine. And so this leads to naturally to a very key point. And that is that cosine is not just about distances and angles. It is an essential part of JPEG. Without cosine, there is no JPEG. So what this is saying is that the mathematics we learn in high school has a use way, way beyond the sort of problems that we go through at a high school. Amazingly, in five or ten minutes, I can show you how cosine can be used to summarize data so well. Even if you don't quite follow the mathematics, stay with me because it all comes together in plain English towards the end of this video. Rather than look at a table of uh, digits that represent a small square in the photograph while we had, which we had before, I'm just going to look at a very small line in the photo, which the computer would initially store using these 12 numbers. So how can we use cosine to represent these numbers in a more efficient way? Well, the first thing to do, I suppose, is to, to graph those numbers. So here's a graph, and you can see that I've taken the 12 numbers and just plotted them on the graph. So the first thing I can do is look at the average of all of these numbers, which turns out to be about 74. So I'll draw that red line there at 74. Okay, so let's move on now and let's now introduce cosine. This is the cosine function if I graph it. And by that I mean that you can feed in any number into cosine. You can have cosine of 1, cosine of 2.5, cosine of 350 and they'll all give you a number as an output. And all those numbers will be between negative 1 and 1. And when you plot the cosine function, this is what it looks like. It's sort of a, a, a wave that just goes between negative 1 and 1. You might remember that from school. Now what I want for what I'm going to do today, for, these, for the particular data that I've got, those, those 12 numbers, I, I end up needing three times cosine x. So here you can see I've now plotted in red three times cosine x. And that three just multiplies everything from the cosine times three. So you can see here this the cosine goes through one here. So three times cosine will go to, will go part through three up here. Okay so now let's go back to our photo I mean our, our graph that had the data. So it's getting a little bit busy, but here we have the data here, the black line. That's the data from the photo. I've drawn that 74 up the top, and down the bottom you can see the 3 times cosine x, which we had before. But because of the scaling, this is now stretched out, this 3 times cosine x. So you can just see that curve going between positive 3 and negative 3 down the bottom in red. Okay. So now what happens when we add the two together? You can see now we've got that, we had the line at 74 and now it's got a bit of a curve in it. So that's not that close to the line of the data yet, but I want to do it once more. So let's go back to our graphs of cosine. You can see in black I've got the cosine x that we had up before. Here it is in black. Now what I want to do is I want to shift it across a bit. I want to shift it so that the line actually goes through the, the cross on the graph, the point zero, 0, or the origin. So that's what you can see in red. It's just a, it's a cosine curve that's been shifted slightly, shifted to the right. Now some of you will recognize this as the sine curve. So in this talk I'm going to Sort of sometimes I'll talk about it as sine x, sometimes I'll talk about it as the shifted cos x function. Now, for what I want, um, for this particular photo, I need actually to multiply that sine x or shifted cos x function, the red one, I want to multiply it by 10. In fact, I want to multiply it by negative 10. So That's what you can see down at the bottom now of our main graph. 
You can see here that this red going between negative 10 and 10, which is what you would expect, and it goes through that point zero zero, which you would also expect. Now let's add this negative 10 sine x down here onto our curve up the top, which is 74 plus 3 cos x. And here we see the magic. So here we now have got very close to the photo. So the line in red will be a very good representation of the data that we have. Let's not get too worried about those endpoints, the 72 and the 89. They can be fixed up in other ways. But you can see for the main body of the data in the photos, uh, the curve, I say again, the curve is a very good approximation to the data. So good, in fact, that your eye probably won't be able to tell the difference. And here's the central point. If I want to represent the data in its original form, I have to use 12 two-digit numbers to represent that part of the photo. But now we can see with these the cos and the shifted cos, I can represent it with only a few numbers. All I need is 74, 3 and negative 10. That's a massive improvement. Roughly speaking, we'll require 75% less storage space and it will be four times faster to store and transmit the photo. Now there's a lot more to JPEG than I've shown you with this simple example. But what I've tried to do is get at the core of JPEG using uh, an explanation that will uh, be accessible to the widest number of people possible. At this point there are three questions that people might typically ask me. So let's go through them quickly. The first is, what do you do if the curve does not get close enough to the photographic data? Well, in that case, the simple answer is that you use more terms. So as well as cos x sine x, we start adding cos 2x sine 2x, cos 3x sine 3x, etc. Until we get close enough to the data. Second question, which is a really good one, is where do we get the numbers... 74, 3, and negative 10. Well, the 74 is easy. That's just the average of the data. But where do we get the 3 and the negative 10? And this goes beyond the video today. Uh, the simple answer is that I was lazy and I used a website. You can find it by searching Greg Thatcher Fourier. Um, and that's actually really good because you can play around with different curves and see, see the effect of adding... Uh, different curves together. Um, but if you're interested and you understand a bit of integral calculus and you found this video fairly easy, then you could have a look at my video Fourier or Fourier, depending on how you want to say it, Fourier series made easy. And the final question is why cos x? What's so special about cos x? Well, there are two attributes that these cosine curves uh, satisfy. The first is that we want to be able to handle virtually any sort of data that comes from a photo. That's important. We need the process to work for virtually any sort of photo. And the second attribute is that it doesn't take that many cosine curves to describe the data, and we've seen that in the example. So those two attributes make the cosine curves better than uh, other sorts of curves that you could use. But beyond that, it's, uh, it's really something for another video to explain. Let me finish with a short story. Back in 1940, there was a boy born in India, and his parents gave him the name Nasir. He went to the Bishop Cotton Boys School in Bangalore and in the course of that he studied cosine and he did calculations like the distance to flagpoles. And at the time some of his friends and some of the adults around him thought what's the point of doing this because after all even back in 1940 it was um, these were pretty basic surveying calculations. Anyway his name was Nasir Ahmed, now Professor Ahmed because he subsequently got a PhD, and with two other mathematicians, 
these two mathematicians wrote this paper, Discrete Cosine Transform, which is arguably the critical paper in the development of JPEG. Now, you could argue that if he hadn't learned about cosine, then someone else eventually would have helped write a paper like this that would have led to the development of JPEG. But what we can say is this, no mathematics, no JPEG.